Stay with us. For more than a decade, the American Medical Association has waged a campaign to ban boxing, but it is for reasons that go beyond the physical punishment involved that true boxing enthusiasts are rethinking their commitment. No fan was more diehard than Pete Hamill, but faced with what he sees as a sport whose participants are being systematically robbed, permanently injured, and killed. He is considering throwing in the towel. In this month's Esquire magazine, Pete Hamill offers some suggestions for saving the sport he once loved. Also joining us with his opinions on Hamill's reforms and some ideas of his own, President and CEO of Time Warner Sports, Seth Abraham. He is responsible for much of boxing success on cable and pay-per-view television, and I'm pleased to have both of them here. Uh, welcome. Uh, you know, because I've come to the garden uh, when, when you were televising, uh, that I love the sport, but I think the points that uh, Pete raises uh, merit our consideration and the consideration of everybody who's a fan of this as you are. What prompted this for you? Uh, there were a number of things, but I think seeing Evander Holyfield come back, uh, still again, uh, seeing the shape that Muhammad Ali is in right now, uh, watching the series of what I call legal fixed fights, uh, which are fights fixed not by some gangster in a pinky ring under the stands, but by matchmaking, by making sure that Mike Tyson will never fight anybody who would be even dangerous to an usher, never mind to <laughs> Tyson himself. Uh, and Holyfield uh, is now being announced as the next uh, victim of uh, Tyson. There's no Riddick Bow there. So, uh, seeing that and... And understanding that the heart of it, Charlie, is that this is the entertainment business, that boxing is part of entertainment in the sense that all sports is entertainment, and seeing the battering some of these guys are getting, watching people like Roberto Duran, age 45, the greatest lightweight fighter maybe of his era, certainly, and maybe of all time, still fighting away at age 45, seeing characters like Butterbean turn it into wrestling, watching Don King matchmake women uh, as part of his shows, um, I, and looking particularly at ex-fighters who have no pension plans and no health plans. Old fighters, for example, like Jerry Quarry, who we've seen a lot of on television in the last couple of months, uh, walking around with pu pugilistic dementia, punch drunkenness, uh, with no... Uh, no more coverage than some poor wino in the gutter. He has no plans, uh, no health plan, no medical plan. To see that, I say, I don't want to be entertained by this anymore. This is too much in a, in a, in a country in which maybe there's enough violence uh, as it is. And if we're going to keep it, uh, clean it up. You know, either clean it up or get rid of it. And uh, Seth, who I know has thought hard and long about this, um, and I, I think agree on the on the on the uh, need to straighten it out. How we go about doing it, I think, is the is the great question right now. Okay, but before we go to the great question, how do we get to this point? Is it just because entertainment values have swept over sport in America? I think all sports have been infected by what we used to think was the fraudulent part of entertainment. Remember, the the thing about sports is that it's entertainment without a script. You're not supposed to know the outcome. There's not supposed to be a script. If there's a script in a boxing match, it's a fixed fight. Uh, if we know uh, the American Olympic team, basketball team, is going to slaughter the world, it's not a contest anymore. There has to be a contest. And I think television has driven it harder than ever to make drama overcome quality in certain ways. And that the amount of money involved has made sure has has made it now absolutely mandatory for promoters to try to keep control of those fighters who do earn money, and that means never put them at risk. Make sure they never get hurt or or, or challenged or end up in a, an absolute contest. So I think there's a combination: okay. television, money, and the entertainment uh, slopping over into uh, sports. Take a look at this: Riddick Bowe versus. Evander Holyfield, November 4th, 1995, rounds five and six. Here it is. 
Evander Holyfield can have as many as five minutes to recover from this. And now he says he's ready to go. But Bomanski, the Nevada State Athletic Commission doctor, is sitting in Holyfield's corner. Holyfield taking a couple of heavy shots. Holyfield, Holyfield is really hurting. He looks like he's ready to go. He looks like he has nothing to get back. He just became 33 going on 53. Evander Holyfield has never been knocked out in his professional boxing career. You gotta punch this up, keep him up. You gotta punch this up, guys. An extremely oh, concerned up, George Foreman is presently on his feet, suggesting to Joe Cortez that he thinks a stoppage wouldn't be inappropriate. And now Holyfield seems to have run out of gas. Let's go. Bo getting himself back together. Got an excellent chance now to make it out of the rounds. And maybe even to turn it around the way Holyfield did on him in round 10 of the first fight. Here comes Bo. I would never, ever believe that I would see this of almost a mirror image of what we saw before. All right, come on, come on, come on. Bo looking at Cortez to ask for help. He says, Evander hit me on the back of the head with the left hand. Come on, get him out of there. Come on, let's go. Let's go. That's the first time Bo is down as a professional. Evander, an extra point in round six for the knockdown, but I still scored that other end round five, nine to nine. I scored it even. I'll tell you, this is tremendous stuff. Hard right hand inside by Holyfield, and now down goes Evander. A right hand by Bo. A right hand inside. As Holyfield lunged to get back at him. Seven. Did the trick. Don't think he's going to make it. Nine. No, he made it. How do you feel? Yeah. How, how do you feel? Take us forward. Take us forward. How does he feel? Take us forward. Take us forward. Wonderful. Terrific. Right, Third knockdown this on is Holyfield's it. career. This is the end. The fourth, and that's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, that's an example of, I suspect, what you're talking about. Uh, what do you say? Going in, an evenly matched fight. Hall of Field, a tremendous warrior. There is no, I agree with much of what Pete has said and written in Esquire, there is no standardization about medical safety, medical regulations. Earlier in the fight, um, Hall of Field knocks Bo down, and Bo struggles to get up. So going in, evenly matched. Should Holofield have retired after the fight? He obviously hasn't. He has continued to fight. Uh, I guess only Evander and his doctors, in a sense, could make the decision in the absence of a federal regulatory commission or state athletic commissions saying, Evander, enough, it's time to stop. Men, as you know, Charlie, like Foreman, are fighting now in their late 40s, and some men are fighting in their early 50s. The problem, there's no standardization of these rules there's carpet bag boxing. Can't get sanctioned in this state, go to another state. It happens all the time. But what about some of the other broader points that Pete's raising other than just this, other than standardization? I mean, do we need other things to protect fighters? I read Pete's article. I called him. I then read it again. And Pete and I have had several conversations about this. I believe that at this point, the only way that you can really reform the sport of professional boxing is some sort of federal commission. It really took the Treasury agents and Elliot Ness to clean up Chicago as a federal agent, not a state or local agent. And I think it's going to, frankly, take some kind of federal boxing commission that would have jurisdiction over all the states and interstate commerce at this point to really, really make some significant reforms. What I'd like to do is recapture some of the conversation you guys had on the phone, but when you hear Seth say that, I mean, what, is that the answer? Well, I, I worry, Federal even though, even though Senator McCain from Arizona, who's, a, who's my favorite Republican, uh, uh, is for this, or is investing, in, you know, looking into it right now, I think the chances under a Republican Congress of getting still another bureaucracy set up uh, to handle one sport because there is no federal bureaucracy handling any other sport, um, might be very difficult to do. The re what, what I had suggested in the piece is that the, the people like uh, Seth and HBO and Showtime and ESPN and the casinos themselves form the governing body, because the real problem is there is no governing body. 
there is nothing uh, the equivalent of the Major League Baseball Association. There's nothing like that. And use the model of the movie industry, is what I had suggested, the MPAA, or <clears throat> so that you can have the people with money who pay for this and to some extent profit from it uh, as the central governing body. This would in turn allow the fighters to form a union. Every other sport has a union. If, you're a, if you hit 202 in the major leagues for five years, you get a pension. Roberto Duran gets no pension, having fought for 25 or 30 years. And he'll be walking on his heels outside the Port Authority some night when we come walking down the block. So no matter whether you do it the way I suggested or the way Seth would rather do it through a federal thing, there must be a governing body. Somebody's got to be in charge of the sport. Whether the government should get into it, I think, is, okay, is, is a question. Okay, is this what he's talking about realistic, Sam? Well, this is what he and I have discussed. I think that if you try to do it outside the jurisdiction of the federal government, I can't imagine that this commission or whatever it would be would be empowered to enforce these rules, whether it's fighter passports. Because, again, fighters become carpetbaggers or their managers become carpetbaggers, and they just move their fights like a traveling entourage minstrel show from state to state. If a fighter can't get licensed in one state because of a torn retina, some states prohibit fighters from fighting with torn retinas. I believe California, Nevada. They move to another state where it's not an issue. So I think unless you have some kind of overarching commission, there is no Major League Baseball. There is a Major League Baseball commissioner, but you don't have that in boxing. There is one in football, basketball, nothing in boxing. Although I'm generally not for federal intervention, if we're going to do it, I think it has to be an organization that has clout. How much effort are you and the people who promote the fights and the promoters themselves and the people in Vegas doing to change boxing? I would say, regrettably, not enough. Why? Well, the Rubicon that, that I've crossed, and maybe that HBO has crossed somewhat, is that I've always thought our role is as a broadcaster. We are there to fire up the cameras, put them on the event, and then we move on. But what if the survival of the sport is at stake? Well, that's the Rubicon we've crossed. That I do believe the survival of the sport is at stake. And in Pete, in one sense, I found a kindred spirit who said, wait a second, this sport is either going to die, and it, it will, if fans don't support it, the sport will in fact die, it'll just go away. So the Rubicon that I've crossed is that I think we have to be more HBO Time Warner, has to be more proactive in trying to find ways to protect the fighters and reform the sport. Well, uh, Seth, would there be any way, for example, for you to talk to, uh, or you on behalf of HBO, to talk to these other people, uh, Showtime, to ESPN, et cetera, and say, hey, we're all in various degrees going to be affected by this if this dies. And it died once before. It died in the 50s um, and was brought back by Muhammad Ali in the 60s. But if it dies now, that'll be the end of it. Uh, is there any way just in self-interest that people would gather together and say, we gotta, we got to standardize this, we have to make rules, we have to decide what these rules are? The problem, Pete, good word, self-interest. There are too many self-interests, and not enough people care about the health of the sport itself and the health of the prize fighters. That's part of the problem. Well, then just tell me, saying they're not enough, who does? I mean, who stands up to say they care about those values and those fighters and those conditions. I mean, who is raising the clarion call about? I mean, you tell the story. Well, you tell the story of seeing Muhammad Ali. Uh, tell that story. Oh, it was the night of the Tyson Bruno fight, right. and there was a party oh, on, was that a on year Times ago? Square. Oh, Tyson Bruno was this past March. Yeah, yeah. just in March. Um, and there was a big party at a bar in, uh, in uh, Times Square. And Ali was one of the guests of honor, along with Sylvester Stallone, a number of other people. And here was this kid who I had seen as a kid show up to fight Doug Jones uh, as a young graduate of the Olympics. Uh, and he couldn't this get... This was a young Cassius Clay out you know, of Kentucky. He was, he, was the, he was some show. I mean, none of us thought he could fight. We thought, this is a, a permanent amateur. He'll never get around it. But it was like a great show. He was the guy that brought show business in. 
He brought it in. He, you know, not Joe Lewis or Floyd Patterson or Liston or anybody. Ali brought it in the door. He brought because the he trash was an attractive talk. personnel that everybody wanted to have on. Yeah, and the trash talk had a wink in it. Yeah. You know, there was something wonderful and amiable about it. And to see him now, unable to get a piece of chicken to his mouth without the help of, of his wife, who, with tremendous care and love, was helping him. Uh, I said, I can't stand looking at this. And it was interesting because at the fight were Lennox Lewis, and I think Bo was there, and some other people. And they were like a dog that doesn't want to fight with another dog or recognize its reality looking the other way, it away was... from Ali. The Ali, the people that came over to Ali were people like Derek Coleman, <laughs> you know, who would never have to have a fight with anybody. Uh, those who didn't want to recognize that it could happen to them. And no fighter thinks it can. can fighters think they're immortal. Uh, it's one of the wonderful things about them. Suppose Caesar's Palace and the rest of the venues would say, we're not going to be part of this. We will not be a part of these kinds of fights, letting these people, no matter how big the box office might be, no matter how George Foreman makes it look, like attractive, we're not going to be part of it, and tries to set the standards, what would happen? It would have a dramatic impact. Because then why you, don't they do it? Well, to some extent, I can't speak for Anheuser-Busch or Caesars, but I can tell you at Time Warner and HBO, we do attempt to do it. There are fights we walk away from. There are fighters that we release from their contracts. We have contracts with them. We release them from their contracts because we're simply not interested in the propositions that they're presenting Suppose to us. Suppose you could get the rights to Tyson and Foreman. Mm -hmm. Would you buy? I've got to say that today I would. In a, a year or two, I don't know, but today I would. Because you think Foreman is up to that fight at his age based on against what, Mike Tyson? Based on what I've seen... We've done George's last three or four prize fights. I'd have to say yes. You agree with that, Pete? Well, I think that's more competitive than, say, Tyson Holyfield, because as we just saw on the screen, you see this man, young man, shuddering, shuddering, because he's taken too many punches. Not just the punches we see in the ring, but for every punch he takes in the ring, he's taken 100 in the gym. And the gymnasium is the great place of, of great danger. Foreman... The reason he seems the great exception to a lot of this is that he laid off for 10 years. He had 10 years Preaching. in which he did nothing. That's the, and so he has a, basically a second So the cumulative career. impact on him is yeah. not there. I, just as I thought Chavez de la Hoya was a very competitive fight, should have gone on, even though one guy had 100 fight, was worn and torn towards the, in the right. last five or six. But it was a competitive fight. It was an easy fight for de la Hoya, as it turned out, but nobody knew going in. But a Holyfield, looking, if you just look at that little shutter again, anybody who licensed him again ought to be arrested. Uh, who can we point to, A, that did this right? I mean, who walked away from fighting at the right time? I mean, who... Well, there were a number of people. Marciano walked away and never came back. Yeah. Uh, Gene and Tunney walked away and never Tunney's came back. Tunney's really a good example. My, my, my friend, Jose that. Torres, who have been friends for years, when he, at 30, got knocked down in a fight by his former sparring partner, he said, that's it, he walked away, never came back. Some people do do that. And they then prove, most of them, that they have a life after boxing. Yeah. We have to, those of us who care for the sport, have to help them to that. Are we... You know... What's your evaluation, forget this for a second, of the state of boxing today as a sport, as an attractive sport? Because you look at the heavyweight ranks and Tyson's coming back, but Tyson is not fighting Riddick Bo yet. Mm -hmm. I would say that boxing has a perpetual cold. It, it's never germ-free. Yeah. <laughs> There's always a problem with the sport of boxing and always will be a problem, I think, by the nature of it. It's a very brutal business. If you're asking me, is it terminal? I'd say no, it's still extraordinarily popular. As this weekend showed, the De La Hoya Chavez fight, the fight sold out in four hours. 17,000 tickets, some of it priced at $1,000, sold out in four hours. So that was a good example, in a sense, of what's right with the sport, a competitive match, popular appeal, et cetera, et cetera. But Charlie, the sport is always going to have problems, and I think right now some of the problems can be fixed 
if enough people set their mind to it and say, you know what, this is a crusade worth, worth waging, as I think Pete pointed out. I mean, he threw in the towel, but maybe he kept a finger on it somewhere. Did you? I, I, I think that's a good way of putting it, Seth. I mean, I threw in the towel. I'm, I'm a sort of yes, but type. Good. I'm <laughs> I'd like on to that. get, I'm counting get on rid that. of this, but if you're going to keep it, you and know. fix it. I mean, uh, in my heart, I mean, I'm somebody who grew up in New York in the 40s and 50s. I saw Ray Robinson. I saw Graziano. I saw the, some of the greatest fighters who ever lived, Basilio and, and uh, Marciano and all of those guys when I was a kid. Uh, and Lamada, uh, I saw. I didn't see Lamada with Robinson, although they fought six times. But, but to see those and know that standard, and to know that there are fighters today who are just as good. I think De La Hoya would be as good a fighter then as as, as some of the others. Uh, Roy Jones, I think, is a terrific young fighter. But what I'm that's looking at it from the craft on an almost an aesthetic ground. But what has happened, the price that's being paid by these guys, by going too long to the well, that's the thing that wearies me. I would love to be a guilt-free boxing fan. I'd love to walk into the Madison Square Garden, see a terrific fight, and not walk home saying, someday I'm going to have to hand this guy a dollar outside the Port Authority. I don't want to do that. I, want, I think every fan of that sport should feel that way, that they can be guilt-free, that the fighters are taken care of, that nobody's going to get very badly hurt in a sport that's, by definition, brutal, um, and that we can cheer the glory of it when it happens. When it happens, it's like dance. It's like some brutal, violent dance. What's the last great fight you saw? Hagler Hearns. Oh, really? I saw that. Yeah. That's, that's the best. My vote. Mine, too. All right. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Seth. Great to see you. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us.